So I'm presenting about chapter 13 about multiple testing. So I think in the beginning where they talk about, like they present some what's hypothesis testing. So just a recap. So the usual way how we do hypothesis testing is we have a very specific research questions or you have something like the questions that you want to explore. So usually it's supposed to be a single now hypothesis, which is this H0, which or you can call it H0. So one typical example is where you look into, let's say the blood pressure of mice in control and treatment group. And we, for now hypothesis, will assume that the mean or the blood pressures for both groups are usually the same. So when we have a multiple hypothesis, hypothesis testing, so you have a number, so it starts with, let's say you have up to M number. So now hypothesis one, two, now hypothesis M. So we still expect, so we still expect them to have no difference in the treatment versus the control group. But here, usually you have something like, um, the now will be like the expected values of the J biomarkers among mice in the controls and the treatment groups are equal. So you may look into, let's say, gene sequencing, and you have a number of genes that you want to look at it. So let's say you want to see which gene causes cancer. So you could be like running multiple tests, then you will have a multiple now hypothesis. So hypothesis testing is just a simple yes or no question. So for example, now is usually there's no difference. Alternative is there is a difference between the two groups. So they talk about next is there are four testing steps. So first you need to define the now and alternative hypothesis. Then you need to construct the test statistics followed by computing the p-value and decide whether to, as you cannot say accept, like fail to reject or rather to reject the null hypothesis. So let's go through the steps. In step one, your null hypothesis is usually the default state of belief about the world. So one typical example is we have two null hypotheses here. So the first one we can look the coefficients of beta j, let's say in a linear regressions of y onto the x is usually equal zero, or there's no difference between the mean blood pressures between control and treatment group. Alternative is the coefficients of beta is not zero, and there is a difference between the mean blood pressure in control and treatment group. So one thing to note is, I find interesting here, I never thought of this, like they say the treatment of now and hypo alternative hypothesis is asymmetrical. So because we always treat now as a default state of the world, so we always want to focus on using data to reject the now. But then if we do reject the now, then this helps us to provide evidence which what we prefer, we want to get evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So we are actually making discovery about things, but if we fail to reject now, there are things that we do want to consider. So we wouldn't know like when you fail to reject, you wouldn't know whether is it because our sample size was too small or which leads to our failure to reject the now or we fail to reject because the now is actually true. So these are the things that I find very interesting that we have to think about. Then next, like they talk about how we want to construct test statistics. Let's say we focus on the t-test. Okay, so the t-test is where we compare the group between uh, the means between two groups. So for instance, we have like the x denotes the blood pressure, uh, blood pressure measurements. So we have treatment groups, control groups, and now it's like the mean will be the same. And this is just the formula for T. So what we're actually hoping for is in order for us, which is the following step, for us to reject the P value, you would want this T to be big. So you want, there's a difference between the two groups. 
and we want to check how big is this difference. So you want this denominator, the numerator, you want the numerator to be as big, so you can get a bigger t. So a larger t always gives us evidence against now, and which is when it's against now means you are like supporting your alternative hypothesis. But the problem is you get a t value, but you want some kind of like a concrete measurement, like what is the threshold? Like when is actually the right time to actually reject the now hypothesis? How big the t should be? So what you come up with is a p value. There are a lot of controversies around like p values, like, but let's, I'm not going into that, but p-value is they talk about we should really think about how we define p-value. So p-value is not the probability of like how you get a now then the probability like how small that your now is false. Instead p-value is just a probability of you getting a test statistics in this case t that is extreme as the observed statistics. And it's important, you always have to assume when you're doing p-value, you always have to assume that the null hypothesis is true, the h naught is true. So good thing about p-value is it transforms, you get a number, something that easily interpretable, is between zero to one, and the small p-value means more, against, more evidence against your h naught. So, Based on the previous, let's say we have a t of 2.33, okay? This is big enough, but so what we are looking at is when we're constructing the p, so we want to know what is the probability of having observed such a value, like such large value of t, so when the null hypothesis is true. So this is a figure, if you look at, this is a normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one. So this blue line, the vertical line is indicating your T value, which is 2.33. So remind, just to remind you guys, that now is the mean should be equal. So what you can see under this figure, like you have 1% on the right here, about 1% on the right here. So this is the area, like about 1% area under the curve. So this is about, so it takes about one out of 50. So it's about 2% chance of observing an N value that is greater than 2.33. Okay, and that's why the P value is about 0 0.02. So when you have a zero P equals to 0 0.02, it just means given that the now is true, you only see such a big T, 2% of the type, which is one out of 50, the probability. Then decide whether the next, the final step is you have to decide whether you do want to reject the now hypothesis or not. So, I think it goes into like linguistics where we shouldn't say something like accept the alternative hypothesis, rather than we should say as like we re reject the now or we fail to reject it now. Okay, so I mentioned it, small p value. Small p values means evidence against the now. Then, uh, so in this one, like in my field, like our p value threshold is always set at zero point zero five like certain fields, like I think medical fields, they have a more stringent criteria for their p-value, okay? So when you have a more stringent criteria, like you have a more stringent p-value, it makes it harder to reject the now, which we will talk into it as in now. <laughs> so in order for us to understand like p-value, we need to think about type one and type two error. So, we have actually four scenarios. Given that the now is true, so you either make correct decision or false decision, incorrect decision. So given that your now is true and you did not reject your now, so you're making a correct inference, which is this case here. 
So we have like correct inference here. And given that your null is false, you do reject it, you will get a correct inference. So this is a true negative and this is a true positive. But what is type 1 error? Type 1 error is just given that when the null is true and yet we rejected the null hypothesis, which is what we call as the false positive. And we can also think of it this type 1 error as alpha. Then the false, the other incorrect decision that you might make is when your now is false and yet you fail to reject the now. So you get a false negative. That's our probability that's usually the beta. Uh, okay, then power. So power is just this, power is just, um, how do I say? So power is just one minus beta, which is this one here. So this is power. So your power is just the probability of you make when your now is false and you manage to reject it. And we do one high power in our study. Then, uh, then I also look into here like the relationship between type one and type two error. So there's a trade off. So it seems that we put more emphasis on the type one error, which is we do not want to incorrectly reject the now when the now is in fact true. So we try always try to keep the alpha rate the type one error alpha rate to minimum. But in this case, when you try to keep the alpha to minimum, you actually in um, reducing the power because you're not getting, like you will not be getting this where your now is false and you fail to reject. It makes it more difficult when you have a smaller alpha, it makes your power also smaller as in you do not, when your now is false, you always fail to reject it. So it's harder to reject that. So there's a trade-off between this alpha and power. So now moving on to multiple testing. So I'll first talk about the challenges then I'll move on to their different methods on how we can counter for this multiple testing as in we do not want to inflate our alpha. So the first one is when you have multiple testing means you have multiple null hypothesis. Then given that usually let's say, let's keep it to P value, let's say 0 0.05. So let's say you have 10 null hypothesis and you consistently read decide whether to fail to reject or reject the now based on P is equals to 0 0.05. So when you have 10, you're making actually, what they are saying is when you consistently using the same threshold and without um, taking into consideration that you have multiple testing, you're actually inflating the alpha value. So, means we are actually making a lot more like type one error. This is the analogy that they try, the story that they put in the book. So let's say like two to the power of 10, let's say we flip the coins like fair, you will get either head or tail about 10 times each. So we will expect there's an average that one coin will come out all tears. So for all 10 times, at least one coin will come out all tears. So, but then because we call like counting how many now, we actually have like multiple now hypothesis, right? So if the coin is fair, then the probability of at least observing at least one 10 tiers is actually less than, is one over one zero two four because there's only one probability. So one over 1024, which is less than 0 0.05. 
And then since it's less than 0, 0, 001, then we decide to reject the null, which we might make a mistake step. Okay, so we rejected the null, even though it's kind of fair con. So it means that when you do a lot of multiple hypothesis testings, it almost certainly that you will get one small p-value by chance. That's always you will get one small p-value. And if we do make a decision based on that one small p-value, so we will commit like more likely to commit, make a wrong decision. Okay, so what they are saying is we are more likely to make a large number of type one errors, which is false positive. So how we can roughly approximately calculate the false positive is let's say you have 10,000 now hypothesis means another 10,000 alternative one. And we decide to do like, let's say we set our P to 0 0.01. So if you times 0 0.01 times 10,000 means we are expected to falsely reject 100 now hypothesis by chance out of 10,000, like 100 times you will falsely reject the now hypothesis. Then what we can do is they say you should try to control for the family-wise error rate. So family-wise error rate is special, like exclusive for the multiple testing, hypothesis testing. So it's similar where here is making the correct decision, the B and the W. Mm -hmm. and the U and the S is the correct decision. So the V is the incorrect decision and W is the incorrect decision. Um, so V is actually our false positive and W is our type two, which is the beta, the false negative. So in practice, we do not know how many times that we have made a wrong decision. So you do not know when you have actually falsely rejected the now or falsely in did not reject the now. So what we can do is they calculate, uh, we have this formula where we calculate our family-wise error rate, the alpha, using one minus P probability of V equals zero. V is the false positive. Okay, means do not falsely reject the now. Any. So it's also equivalent like one minus P probability of do not falsely reject any now hypothesis. In making this family-wise error rate, you need to assume that all your M tests means all your now testing are independent, which might not be the case all the time. So we do have to counter for that later on. And next is, uh, what is it? Ah, this is a figure where they show us how family-wise error rate as a function of number hypothesis. So this is the number hypothesis lock on the lock scale, and this is the error rate. What you can see when the alpha, we set it as 0 0.05, the family-wise error rate is higher. Okay. So as the number of hypothesis, more now hypothesis that you have, your family-wise error rate increases. Then, for this alpha 0 0.0001, which makes it very difficult to reject, the alpha rate is still increasing. So it's going up to when you have 500, it's up to 0 0.4. Um, okay. So what you can see in that figure is when we set the alpha as the orange line, when you set the alpha as 0 0.05, it resulted in very high family-wise error rate, even though when you have a moderate. So with larger data that we do get, especially with exploratory data analysis, where you want to test as many hypotheses as possible, we do run into this risk of committing type one error. So let's say we run about 100 independent tests. 
then our family wise error rate is calculated as in like one minus one minus alpha, which is zero point, which is zero point one minus zero point zero five zero point nine five to the power of one hundred. So this lead to let's say just taking alpha of zero point zero five, and you have one hundred now hypothesis. You your family wise er your error rate is about zero point nine which is about 1%, but almost guarantee. It means that you almost will be guaranteed to make type 1 error. <clears throat> there are few methods to control for family-wise error rate. I really enjoy this part because I've been using like Bon Ferroni and the Holmes that down so I'm not sure like the distinction between like different methods and procedures then I think this is a good one the bon Ferroni method is the simplest method where you just get a uh, alpha you decide on your alpha let's say 0 0.05 and you divide by how many tests that you have like let's say your now hypothesis you tested like multiple testing your m is five you just take 0 0.05 divide by five then you decide to reject your p value you look at each of the tests and you decide on that 0 0.01 so what does it mean i will show you the data so we can at least have a look um, this is a formula. I don't think I will go into detail, but the theory is you just want an alpha divided by, you want the probability of the event to be smaller than any of this uh, alpha that you have decided, let's say 0 0.05 and let's say M, we have five tests. So 0 0.05 divided by five, that will be 0 0.01. Okay, so example, we look into this, I think fun data set. So we have five managers. We want to look at their performance in terms of their work performance. So manager one to five, you can see just looking at the mean, you can see the manager one and manager, manager three. Their mean are about the same. Um, four and five, their means are nearer. So it seems that one and three, their performance is like super high. Then four and five and two seems to like underperform a bit. So we have five now hypothesis. So your M is five. And let's say we decided to stick with alpha is 0 0.05. So you 0 0.05 divided by five, now your probability, new probability is 0 0.01. Based on that value, p-value, it seems that only manager one and manager three, their p-value is below 0 0.01. Oh, no, sorry. Only manager one. It seems that only manager one is under 0 0.01. Okay, so we only rejected the now hypothesis only for the first manager. So this is using bond Ferroni method. So the problem is bond Ferroni method is, is very conservative, as in they will try not to reject now hypothesis. So there's an, another method, which is the home step down procedure, also known as home bond Ferroni method. I think this is the preferred method so far in my film. So this is less conservative. And in the sense that when we say less conservative means that it will reject more now hypothesis. So means we more likely to commit fewer type two errors and it has higher power as well. So here are the steps actually how you want to control the family wise error rate. So because Holmes method, they do not make any independence assumption about the hypothesis test. 
So because they do not make any independence assumptions, so they will at least reject as many now hypotheses as von Ferroni, and sometimes is even rejecting more. So what is do is we specify, let's say we specify alpha in which we want to control for family-wise error rate. Let's keep it to 0 0.05. Then after that, you do want to compute the p-value for each of the null hypothesis. Then what is interesting after that is compared to von Ferroni, you do want to reorder, not real. You do want to arrange your p-values from the smallest to the largest. Okay, then after that, you want to define and look for this L minimum. And you want to reject all the null, which is lesser than this L. So in this case, I've calculated. So here, as you can see, still the same data set. I reorder the P. So now the first P is the smallest one is 0 0.006. The second one is manager tree 0 0.012, then subsequence. So what happens is we use this formula alpha divide M plus one minus J. J refers to the position. So this is, one, two, and three. So what happens is when you compute this 0 0.05, the alpha divided by five now hypothesis plus one, then minus the first their position for the P. What we get is 0 0.06 is still lesser than 0 0.01. So we do reject that. Then 0 0.012, is still lesser than 0 0.0125. So we do not reject that. Then the third one is 0 0.601, definitely is larger. So we fail to reject the now for the third P value. So compared to bond Veroni, just to remind you, bond Veroni is earlier we rejected the now hypothesis only for the first manager. But in this Holmes bond Veroni method, we actually reject the null hypothesis for the first and the third managers. So this implies that also, this also implies that the L is three because at the third one, we fail to reject. So the L is three. And we do reject extra one. So the second method, you will definitely reject more null hypothesis if not equal to the first von Peroni method. So this is the illustrations where there's simulations where we do know the real, real simulated situation where you have, uh, I think we have 10 points, right? Yeah, so you have M10, means 10 now hypothesis. The red points, we have about eight. Eight red points, those are the false now hypothesis, which we would want to reject. And the black one is the true, and which means we should fail to reject. So these are ordered, the P value they are ordered because means they are arranged from smallest to largest and plotted. So the black line are those tests that are being rejected by von Ferroni. So you can see on the left panel, um, Born Ferroni method, the black line, it fails to reject one. Then for the center panel, it seems that almost fail to reject one. And on the right panel, it fails to reject five. Okay. The blue line is the second approach, which is the Holmes method, a procedure. So the first left panel is about the same, their performance. These two approaches, they are about performing the similarly, even for the center one. But if you look at the right panel, bond ferroni method on the right panel, bond ferroni method only rejected three now, whereas the Holmes method procedure it rejected all the eight now hypothesis. So conclusion is. From that figure, 
it seems that they are almost making the same conclusion of black point means they don't falsely reject the now when it's in fact true. But it seems that only Holmes procedure rejected more now hypothesis. Takeaway point is more thoroughly is easy, is you can just divide by how many tests you have, then you can easily. Holmes is slightly more complicated, but it will lead to more rejection while also controlling for your family-wise error rate. So Holmes is actually a better choice. I'll pause here. Any question? Is there any question? Or else I will continue. Uh, no, it's you're you're presenting it very clearly. So it's I will say like the correction in home mm -hmm. just seems wild to me that that would work. I'm not getting the intuition of oh. why putting it in order and just, you know, relaxing yeah. it, like why yeah. that works. I, yeah, I know the mechanics, but I, I'm still not sure like actually how it does work, like by yeah. the ordering things, right? Then why it rejected more now hypothesis. That's interesting. Yeah, I was trying to like go back and see if I would get anything <laughs> we're looking at the book but it just okay it it does a slightly different job i don't know that it's necessarily better because it you know it moves the line of if you accept incorrect too often or reject correct too often anyway. i have a very incomplete intuition about it okay i don't know if i can explain it very well but let me give a stab at it so the difference between single hypothesis and multiple hypothesis tests that we have multiple things <laughs> we're looking at, right? And so in some ways, we can test the distribution. I mean, that's kind of what we, like just applying a single line cutoff to every single hypothesis test and saying, well, they all have to be, they all have to meet this really strict standard that does seem very conservative when, what we, we we're really trying to do in some ways is see whether uh, what we observed is consistent with the distribution. I mean, if we go back to a single hypothesis test, we have one observation from a distribution. We're trying to see if it lies in the wings. Like, is it plausible right. that this number was picked from this distribution? And when you only have a single one, you kind of arbitrarily say, well, if it's too far out in the wings, then I'll say, no, it wasn't but it could have been. But when we have lots of things we're picking and the idea is that they're picking them from this distribution, then this is, this is where my intuition gets fuzzy, but it kind of makes sense to put them in some sort of order to see it, like, well, the worst one shouldn't be worse than this. And the second worst one shouldn't be worse than this. And the third one, like, so you can kind of- I think I-, I, I th Does that make any sense? Yes, but I also, I think I have a, a way of thinking about it so in home we're saying okay the first one is just purely bonferrani mm -hmm. and then we accept that we we reject the null hypothesis sorry we don't accept it but we we fail to accept the null hypothesis so now we can kind of take that one out of the set like this is a thing that we've already done and now we're only testing four things we're not testing five things anymore we're testing four things and so now it's only, you know, it's five plus one minus two. It's divided by four instead of by divided by five. We fail to reject that one. Oh, now we're only testing three things. And so we're kind of doing Bonferrani, pretending that we didn't have those things in our testing anymore because we already dealt with those. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah, that's does a that... more uh, precise intuition. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, okay. I can I can get behind that. It still feels a little wild that it works. Like, it, uh, but okay. Um, All of these are some kind of, it's kind of recipes, right? That you yeah you yeah. Know. But I mean, you know, I'm sure if you go back and find the papers where they're introduced, there is some very rigorous statistics behind these that come out to things that look kind of wild, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So yeah, so Probably. they did mention yeah. about that 
like so they say they're not going to statistics but that they do provide a link to the paper in, right. i think in the footnote where you can just refer to it because <laughs> it seems that the stats is very complicated so they totally skip away it. all right okay. let's go on so then we have two more methods to go so turkeys is just so turkeys and sheffield sheffy is how different, but for me, I also got confused as in they are what, quite similar. So what is doing in Turkey is, is they say, if you look into this data set, what do we, we do realize that, okay, manager one and manager three, they have similar mean. So does manager four and manager five. So because we do look into the mean and we have computed the p-value, then they want to do additional tests. So they want to look into pairwise comparisons of the differences in expected mean among a number of groups. So let's say you have like manager one and versus a manager three, you look them as a group, then you compare with other groups. So I think I got confused about this turkey method. So uh, they have this M is calculated using this formula is G. So means G represents how many group-wise comparisons that you do want to conduct. And you want to make, let's say, we have G of six, then we will have about 15 now hypothesis. So if you look at this figure, Turkey method seems to have better power than Bonferroni, but they did not say whether it's better than Popes. So here, the red line is the one, the red dots are the one that you do want to reject. And let me see, I think the, the So I think the blue one is supposed to be the turkey's method. Then the most bottom line, that's the bond -baroni. It seems that turkeys and bond -baroni, when your G is like small, they're actually performing quite similar. But just that maybe on the left panel, turkey seems to reject extra two compared to bond -baroni. But the rest, it seems they are performing quite similar. So they didn't talk much about this and I'm not sure also about the turkey's method where they say they just want to look into pairwise comparisons of the differences in expected mean. Let me see if I have other notes. Um, So uh, Turkey seems, so is, let me clarify that again. So for Turkey, it seems that say you look at the mean, then you realize that manager one and manager three have about similar mean. So we want to just compare the average return for manager one and two plus up together compared to the rest of the managers. So that's how it looks. Whereas for Shafi, it's just, you are testing an arbitrary linear combinations of a set of expected means. It sounds complicated, but it just means, let's say you want to compare manager one and manager three compared to a set another group, which is manager two, four, and five. So turkeys is just manager one, manager three, you compare manager one and manager three. So that's the first now, or then the second now is you can test like manager four versus manager five. Whereas for chef fee is just you testing group of means versus another group of means. And they didn't show like how to calculate these two. 
how do they get the p value everything but they seem so they say um for Sheffy methods there's an s value where you want your alpha s to be controlled so let's say you set an alpha at 0 0.05 what they have calculated based on their computers is the alpha for the s will be Sheffy will be 0 0.002 so what is convenient about Sheffield method is you conveniently use, once you manage to calculate this alpha for Sheffield, you use it for all the null hypothesis. So it's similar like bond for any, so you don't change the null. So it's, everything is like you repeatedly use like 0 0.002 for all the tests that you have. So Takeaway point from this part is born for only help, there are general procedures and they will work in most settings. But let's say in special cases, let's say for Turkey, you want to compare individuals versus individuals, specific individuals, not all combination. Or Sheffy is where you want to compare group versus group. Then these two methods can give you more rejections while also maintaining your family wise error rate. Next is the interesting part, which is the false discount rate. So we know about power. Power is just how many now false now hypotheses that you get. And those are the false now hypotheses that you fail to reject over the total number of false now hypotheses that you have. So it's just a proportion. So here, if you look at the trade-off between I think this is a very nice figure where we look into the trade-off between the error rate, the family-wise error rate versus the power. So this dotted line is 0 0.05. We set our alpha here is 0 0.05. And if you do look, when your M is 10, so when your M is 10, you have 10 now hypothesis, your power is actually about 60, 0 0.6. When you have bigger M, 500, the purple one, here your M is about 20. So what we can conclude is you can should realize as the number of your M, your, as you have more tests, the number of tests increases, your power decreases. So M when it's 10 is about 0 0.6. This is about 0 0.384. Or then this is about 0 0.2. So your power is decreasing as your M number of tests increases. Um, so they talk about um, so when we have a very large M because your power will decrease. So means we need to set our alpha to be more stringent. But when we do set our alpha to be more stringent, we'll be like very super conservative, means we almost will not reject any null hypothesis. So in practice, when we have a large data, when you're doing like exploratory nature kind of research, when your M is large, you might just want to just compromise and just have a few like false neck positive results in it. So they say it's in the trade, like, so it's trading off, like you're trading off between getting more discoveries versus you getting more discoveries when you able to tolerate a few of these false positives. So you do want to have a more rejections because when your M is very large, do remember you do need to set your alpha to be really small in order for you to control this family-wise error rate. So, but when you set it too small, you will not be able to reject. So one way is you don't set it too small, then you keep it at 0 0.05 still. Then you just accept there'll be few false positive results in your data. Um, finding so what we do is they there's a formula for us to calculate false discovery proportion you want how many ratio of false positive the we versus the total positive 
So false discovery rate is when you want to set, let's say, and this is a very arbitrary value, as in this false discovery rate, it depends on the field, also depends on how much you're willing to spend. So if you want to set the discovery rate, like false discovery rate to be quite high, then you might like you might cost less, whereas when you set it too low, you might need to like collect more data, so it's going to get more expensive. So in this case, like false discovery rate, you can set it like let's say twenty percent seems to be like means twenty percent like twenty percent of the time those like rejected now hypothesis like twenty percent of them will be false positive, whereas. 80% will be like roughly the true decisions, the correct decisions on average. So example, <clears throat> let's say we have 20,000 tests. So this is a pharmacy, let's say in a pharmacy, pharmaceutical companies where you want to test multiple drugs candidates and you want to identify a small subset of promising candidates. So it means those effective drugs that works. So, and in this researcher, it sets the family-wise error rates, let's say, it sets it to about 20%. So 20%, I think it, this is 20%. So uh, the control, this is error rate. So, the alpha is 0 0.05 times 20, so you get 1,000. So we will expect our error is like about, out of 20,000, you have about 1,000 to have really small p-values. That's why you rejected that. Um, yeah, so I mentioned this, there's no standard threshold for false discovery rate. So, in order for us to do this, like calculate false discovery rate, the approach is we use this Benjamini Hodgepodge procedure. So, in this procedure, given that you have a set of p values for all your tests, okay, and you want your now you want to get a now hypothesis to reject and to control for your false discovery rate at your pre, you have to specify pre-specified Q, which is the ratio, which is you want to set it maybe like 10%, 20% or 30%. So once you specify that, you compute the p-value for all your now hypothesis, all your multiple hypothesis. And it's similar to Holmes method. You do have to arrange the p-value from smallest to the largest. Then you define that we have an L. Once you arrange it, we define L and we reject all the noun, which is as long as it's smaller than this L, probability of this L. So the formula is this one. So still the same data set, you take 0 0.05, then times, this is the L, the positioning, and divide by how many? Let's say we have five. So this, the FDR is set at 5%. When we set at 5%, we discover that we only managed to reject the first manager and the second manager. So we rejected the null hypothesis for the first and the third managers, means the first and the third manager seems to be performing better than the rest. And for this approach or these procedures, we somehow you need to have these assumptions as in you need to ensure that your p-values are independent or if which would not happen. So you need to at least ensure that those like tests, they are mildly de dependent. So we still, we do want the independence in it when we run this test. Uh, so when we set our FDR discovery rate, the false discovery rate at 5%, so we say that there's no more than a question of like 5%, those are the false positive. So we take about 5% false positive, about 95%, we will get the true results. This procedure is definitely more complicated. 
And if you look at this one, they have, I think this is 20,000. And let me see. It. So this green line is the P threshold. So this is just the family wise error rate. You can see the green line is increasing because this one is 0 0.05, 0 0.1, and 0 0.3. As you increasing your family wise error rate, seems that we managed at least reject. So what you want is to reject the blue dots. The orange line is the p-value threshold corresponding to our false discovery rate control, which is this benjamini hodgepet procedure. On the left one is 0 0.05. This is 0 0.1. The Q means 10%. This is 30%. When your false discovery rate is about 30% here, you do see that we manage to reject these small lines. So let me see. Mm -hmm. So when on the very right panel, so we control it at the Q is 0 0.3, it's about 30%. What they say, they do reject out of 20,000, they manage to reject about 279 now hypothesis. I think I will stop here. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think, <laughs> I think we need to stop there. Yeah. I like the point about like, you know, in different situations, you might you might be fine letting some stuff slide through, um, because basically you're going to test it more. You're going to test those ones that you let through more. So maybe you make you know make the window a little big for a first round, where um, I want to make sure I reject the things that are obviously not having any impact, but keep the ones that might have an impact. And then do some, you know, whatever, some more rigorous experiments or that kind of thing. Um, it's a good way to look at it. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, yes, I never thought of it because I, in my research, we don't really have a multiple testing. So, usually we have very specific questions, but I can see the point where it's relevant in medical field where you want to look at specific genes that might cause cancer. So, you have like multiple genes. And you do want to take out those, eliminate those that are definitely not causing cancers, then maybe just look at those potential genes, then you kind of like look into a smaller subset of genes. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, do I have to prepare? <laughs> yeah. So the question is I did not prepare for the lab. Like how do you how do you guys want to do the lab? Um if you can prepare it, that would be great. Um, if yes, not, I would, I'll try to find some time. Um, and we'll do that last, there's like, there's, is there one section or basically one section left, right? There's a little bit in, um, yeah, it's just the resampling. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll go through that. A, a bit, that's still a bit there. We'll go through the resampling and then we'll do, I haven't even looked at the lab yet, so I don't know how hard it'll be. There isn't a tidy version of this. Oh, that's um, he hasn't, he hasn't done it. Oh. Um, and I'd really like to try to get time to, to make a tidy version. Um, I haven't, like I said, I haven't looked at it, so I don't know. Uh, but I would try to have it ready. Let's let's try to do you know try to knock everything out next week. We'll try to finish and be done with the book. Um, but we'll see what it does. You know, see what what you have time for and what we get done. Um, yeah, and with that, we have another meeting to hop to. So I will see everyone next week and in the Slack. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.